Well, it's finally here, Friday. We've given you an arsenal of tools to use with getting your kids to pay attention to the words you say, to have a new attitude, new behavior, and new character. The thing you have to do, parents, now is make sure you're on the same page if you're lucky enough to be married, okay? Mom and dad, you're together, shoulder to shoulder. If you're a single mom, a single dad, consistency is the key word. But now you're ready to start that journey and keep the good ship family on the right port of call. Good luck as you invest your time and your life in these precious gifts, your kids. Hey, hi, everybody, and thank you again for being a part of Have a New Kid by Friday. And uh, this session is called The Doc Is In, and it's you. You've heard me say that you're the most important teacher to your child that your child will ever have. Don't minimize your words. The things you say, the words you have to give to your kids, the actions you take mean much more than you give yourself credit for. One of the things we've tried to teach in this series is your kid is a somebody and there's nobody else like him. And you, of all people, have to believe in that kid. If you don't believe in that kid, who's gonna believe in him? But does that mean you just kowtow to him and make him happy, happy, happy at every turn? No, sometimes they need to be downright miserable. And you can make sure that happens. Um, so, uh, if you're one of those parents that uh, uses uh, grounding, parents love grounding. And believe it or not, I'm a pro grounder, I like grounding. But I think kids ought to be grounded from everything. I like the 48 hour ground. So if a kid's grounded, he goes no place. He doesn't go to church. Let him get dressed for church. That's the fun part. <laughs> and then you say, where are you going? What do you mean where I'm going? I'm going to church. You're not going to church today. You're grounded. You know that. I'm grounded from church. <laughs> I'm grounded from grandma's house for dinner. Yeah, you ain't going any place. They hate it. So if you're going to use grounding, use real grounding. What we tend to do is select these things, you know, and it's sort of crazy how we do it. But this is Friday, so this is the day that you pull your game plan together. Remember when we started this out, I said the tendency is to say, all right, everybody listen up. You know, things are gonna be different from this point forward. Today's the day you pull the trigger. But you gotta make sure you got your act together. Now you got seven kids. Some of you are prolific. <laughs> uh, my suggestion is you better focus in on a couple areas here with a couple of kids. You try to take them all all seven. You're going to play that game we talked about, whack-a-mole, where you get one down, the next one pops up, and they're going to get the best of you. So uh, review the key principles that you've taken away from this series. Again, that little study guide is there for your use. I hope you're taking advantage of that in your small groups and talk about it. Get ideas from other people. You know, people are always surprised to learn that none of the Lehman kids had curfews. None of them. And we reared five kids. They said, well, what do you mean? I, said, well, I mean, they didn't have curfews. You mean they didn't have a time to be home? No, and they hated it. Dad, would you just tell me what time to be home? Honey, I told you, be home at a reasonable hour. Dad, would you just tell me? Honey, I just did. Now, what a kid would love you to do is say, you'll be home by 1 a.m. or you are gonna turn into a pumpkin. <laughs> and see, we've always resisted that because I wanted my kids to make good choices in life. How do you get to that point? By not giving kids things. Some of us got a few bucks in our back pocket where we could, quote, afford to give our kids anything they want. Your kid doesn't need things. And that's hard for people who have bucks in their pocket not to give their kids things. So if you grew up poor, that's a blessing. Review the key principles that you've gleaned from this series and uh, put them to work. One lady said recently, she said, I can't believe it. My 15-year-old daughter walked in the room and apologized. That is a first. Thank you, Dr. Lehman. And all it was was setting up a situation where the kid was confronted with the reality of what was happening in life. So that's why I say let reality be the teacher. The reality of the situation becomes the great teacher to the child. It keeps you out of that, that uh, mold where you're always the bad guy. It makes the situation the bad guy that she created or he created or he allowed or whatever. So um, when you launch this plan, you have to do this. 
you have to just know that you're the shrink here in charge. I'm no longer with you, okay? I've given you some tools, given you some ideas, and now you're gonna make those judgment calls of what gets done. So what's the situation? How would you diagnose it? What's the purpose of nature? And we didn't spend a lot of time on purpose of nature, but I can tell you this about the word purposive. You haven't used it this week. In fact, you haven't used it this month, the word purposive. You haven't used it this year in all probability. It's an interesting word. A kid throws a temper tantrum at a ball. What do you do? Hannah, who is probably the, probably the most laid back of all of our kids, sweeter than sweet. When she was little, she wanted some treat, and we were walking through a mall, and, and I, I just told her we weren't gonna have that treat, and, and it was the only temper tantrum that kid ever threw in her entire life. And quite frankly, it, it, I wasn't impressed. It was very disjointed. <laughs> There was no synergy in the whole thing. It was sort of bits and parts. And, and the funny part was that Chrissy, my second born, and Kevin, my third born, happened to be with me. And they were walking together on the other side of the mall when this incident happened. And so the kids saw this happen. And intuitively, the kids came over because they knew what dad was going to do. And we joined arms like the three amigos, and we stepped over her together. And I can still remember just shaking her head, tears streaming on her face, saying, this is, this is supposed to be working. <laughs> and, and so the purpose of nature, what's the purpose of nature of that? The kid is saying by way of their action, you are going to do what I want you to do, and I am in what? Yeah. Authority over you. And what St. Paul tried to teach us in Ephesians 6 is, no, that's not how it works. We are in authority over our children. So... You expect the best of them, you give them responsibility, they give back to the family. And it's, it's, it's pretty simple. I think sometimes as a parent you get quiet. You get real quiet. And maybe they dissed you, maybe they said something very inappropriate. Let them figure out that maybe something's wrong. You say, Lehman, with my kid it could be four days. Well, enjoy four days of silence. <laughs> Okay, and, 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 and let them figure out that maybe something's amiss. And then, like I say, then you level them. And you tell them straight out that you are very unhappy about what happened. Okay? Now, the tendency as parents is to say, now listen, if you don't do this, this isn't going to happen. Try not to do that. I know your parents did it. Most parents do it. Young lady, now let me tell you something right now. If this isn't done, you're not going to go to that thing on Saturday. Okay? It's much more fun to say, these are things that need to be done this week. Let it go at that. Then when the event comes, you pull the rug out, and they're not going. I mean, you'll see the anguish on your kid's face, and it's worth it because you've, you've made the point, okay? And again, you can have the slow leak where you slow leak a kid to death, and you see him going down the wrong path, or you can force a blowout. And I'm one that believes in the blowout theory. I think we might as well have the blowout now because this isn't working for any of us. So kids who, remember we said they're all attention getters? And they go from attention getting to power when they get more and more discouraged that life isn't working out because I'm not the king or queen of the hill of the family. We tried to point out no one member of the family is more important than the family. So it's that kind of spirit that we want to enter into this. So the neat thing about... Well, we just mentioned uh, attention getting in power. If you look at your own feelings when a kid does something, you can self-diagnose at what level of misbehavior this kid is. Is he an attention getter? You'll feel annoyed. Is he a power-driven kid? So if all you're doing is being powerful with your kids, you're going to create very powerful children. In a power struggle, who wins? They do. Yeah, your kid's making a fool of himself, but don't think the other adults... Although they're looking at your kid going, I can't believe that kid. They're looking over one notch to you. And they're saying, oh my goodness, those parents. Whew. So when you say, how do I feel about this behavior? And you feel provoked? Like you want to rub their little nose in it? Okay. You got a powerful child on your hands. So attention getting, you feel annoyed. Powerful driven kids, you feel provoked. Like you can't do that to me. Well, I got news for you. They can do it to you. In fact, they just did it to you. So you have to get some kind of equality. 
Sometimes you have to sit with a kid and say, hey, listen, uh, your mom and I have been talking, and uh, you, got, you got four more years to serve in this prison. <laughs> and we really have a choice here to try to make these four years uh, pretty good, or, well, I'll tell you, they can really be lousy. But it's not all going to depend upon me. Some of it's going to depend upon what you do. And that's where you draw the line with kids. You let them feel like, hey, wait a minute, my mom and dad are not stupid. Uh, you know, they're sort of calling my bluff on it. So don't give up. Be optimistic. Be that encourager for your kid without snow plowing the roads of life for them. That's the tough part. Because quite frankly, you do know what's best for your child. The scripture says train up a child the way he should go, which doesn't mean the way you think he should go. It's how God would have your kid go. So you've got two different concepts working here. So you've got to keep your... Uh, self in check. So when things come up with your kids now, okay, now you've, you've got all the ammunition through the introduction all the way through the Thursday session, but when things come up, ask yourself, what do I normally do? What's the new committed me going to do different? And that'll keep you on track. Consistency wins every time. So you need to strive to be consistent. If you're a single parent, be as consistent as you possibly can be. Do not let guilt run your life. Guilt is the propellant for most of the lousy decisions you'll make as a parent. If you're married, lucky enough to be married, I think marriage is the greatest thing going. I've been married forever. But I can't even remember being single. I think it was fun, but I don't remember. <laughs> um, but if you're married, you've got to make sure husband and wife are on the same team. Because if you're not, that's going to throw those kids uh, curveballs that are not going to be helpful ones. So you want to work toward being 100% consistent. Are you going to be 100% consistent? No. You know that and I know that, but it, was, it looked good on paper, so I left it that way. Uh, follow through what you say you're going to do, okay? Um, respond, don't react. It's easy to react. It's hard to respond. And what am I asking you to do? I'm asking you to be disciplined. You're the parent here. You know, you've earned those stripes on your sleeve. So grow up, be the parent. Make those judgment calls. Keep your emotions in check as best you can. Don't threaten your kids. We talked about the authoritarian parents. That's their lifestyle. They just threaten. Don't do it. They're just idle threats. The kids tune them off. I say in the book, don't get angry. Well, I got news for you. You're going to get angry. In fact, I think sometimes it's just flat out good just to say, I am very angry at this situation. And then turn your back and leave because that's what rakes the coals over the kids and lets them get in touch with their feelings. Um, don't give warnings. Warnings are disrespectful acts. Now again, if you go out in the street and talk, you know, you ever watch Jay Leno and his men on the street and he goes out and asks people about life? You go out in the life. You, you go out and ask people about warnings. Are warnings good for kids? Most Americans, most Canadians would say, yeah, of course so. As a parent, you gotta warn your kids about things, really. You really don't. I mean, you want to see a change in behavior, don't warn the kids, okay? Uh, you don't want to hover over them. Don't ask questions. Again, there's a tough one for a parent. We all ask questions. Keep your mouth shut. They'll talk to you. I got one daughter, I'm telling you, when she wanted to talk, she just came in and sat in our bed and talked. Finally, I'd say, hey, honey, we've got to go to bed here. Uh, nighty night. <laughs> and uh, she was 19 at the time. I mean, they just talk and talk and talk. And so when your kid wants to talk, yeah, you got to be available for them. But do they get a chance to monopolize everything? No. There is a cutoff point for that, too. Why? Because mom and dad are important, too. Uh, ask yourself, whose problem is this? Don't own what isn't yours. Mom, I can't find my... Honey, they don't go on my feet. I don't have a clue. I mean, if you'd like me to help you look, I'd be more than happy to. But I mean, you could say it that way. You don't want to just shut the kids down, for sure. So there's only one way to be a good parent, and that is to be that authoritative parent. Not permissive, not authoritarian, but one that clearly says that God did not put me on this earth for me to be run over by you. Kids need to learn to respect their parents. A kid who cannot respect their parent in the home is very unlikely ever to come to terms with Jesus Christ in their life. Because coming, becoming a believer says, you know what? I'm going to submit my will to you, O holy and almighty God. It doesn't happen without that built-in respect in that family. 
So, is being a good parent easy? No, but it is simple. And I hope we've given you enough simple guidelines and with the help of that wonderful little study guy we put together to help you become the parent God would have you be. Good luck. Bless each of you.